I don't have a lot of time, so I couldn't possibly explain the anastasis project in detail. All you need to know is, that it was a bold and very well funded venture involving scientists, paleontologists, historians, programmers and a lot of other professionals from around the globe. As a relatively well known historian, I had the privilege and the despair of being one of the department coordinators. The other hits were Dr. Vega, a brilliant scientist, Mr. Bissett, a friendly French paleontologist, and Miss Kangnan, a woman young enough to be my daughter who developed the software and a neurotransmitter to upload modern language on the Neanderthal's brain once they woke up so we were all able to communicate. My name is Anne Lestrange and I came to peace with the fact that there's nothing else I can do. I can only document what happened so in the future no one else would try again the same disastrous things we did. It's bittersweet for a historian to die this way. It all started when a certain billionaire, whose name I'll omit, got two nearly perfectly preserved Neanderthals on an auction. He then contacted Dr. Vega, his good friend. You think you could reconstruct them and make them alive? With the right team and infinite budget? Sure. Dr. Vega replied. Consider it done. And the billionaire said. The scientists then asked, what for? Eccentric billionaires don't need a good reason to waste their money and other people's time. But then, our boss's reckless demeanor changed. Because, I want to ask them why they were extinct. Dr. Vega told his story over and over, always making it sound more impressive than the former. I confess that it gave me goosebumps on the first time. I always wanted to know it as well. The Neanderthals have been around for over 150,000 years when they disappeared, and no one knows why. We scholars like to believe that they weren't as adaptable as the sapiens. But what could be best than asking them in person? It then became Dr. Vega's project of a lifetime, and I was one of the first people to join him. Just to find the right team, it took him two years. We spent five more years working on bioengineering, historical research, and finally, how to reanimate them. Countless tests were performed in animals to determine the exact electric current that will force their axons to start working and their reconstructed hearts to pump oxygen through their bodies. Then, today was the big day. The first test to try to bring them back to life. If this one failed to bring them to life, we need plenty of months, maybe years to understand what went wrong. If the electricity damaged their bodies, we'd probably never have the chance again. I wish we failed. I wish we never knew why and how they were gone. I want the assistants and general staff out, Dr. Vega yelled. He was a demanding and obnoxious short man, but I loved working with him because it was nothing personal. It was his way of accomplishing our goals. The strange, visit, commands. You history people can push some buttons, right? Judy Gagnon rolled her eyes, but with a smile. I prepared the conference room so the rest of the staff can watch us from there. I wish she wasn't so kind. I wish she just sent them home for the day. We would have so much less blood on our hands now. I'm a paleontologist, that's not history people, Mr. Bissett muttered dramatically as he walked to his assigned panel. After saying some quick encouraging words to my team and sending them off, I headed to my panel too. Doesn't it worry you that they will have no soul, Madame Lestrange? Francois Bissett asked me. He had sweat on his forehead. We can't be sure that souls actually exist, Mr. Bissett. And I'm sure not even Dr. Vega can make an artificial one if they do. I replied calmly, although I was now slightly intrigued. If souls are real, then are our Neanderthals incomplete? Will the experiment work? Language data ready to be transmitted, Miss Gagnon announced with a firm voice, dissipating my negative thoughts. Prepare subjects for electrical discharge, Dr. Vega commanded and the engine started positioning the two Neanderthals in 45 degrees. Their arms, torso and legs were tied to some sort of hammock for safety, 
both theirs and ours. When the bodies started being reconstructed, we couldn't be entirely sure, but we suspected that both the subjects were females. Their bodies were exceptionally and intentionally well preserved, so Mr. Bissett and I inferred that they were really important, probably queens or priestesses. I then nicknamed them Lilith and Eve, the two first women of the world in the Christian mythology. Although Lilith was mostly erased from the Bible for being too insubordinate to Adam, she still survived in obscure apocryphal scriptures though. Lilith and Eve were both dressed in simple, shapeless robes, meant only to cover their nakedness. One of the girls from the biotechnology sub-department had given them here because she feared that they'd be aware that they should have it. No one knew what to expect when they woke up, and no one could expect what would happen. Starting countdown for discharge. The monotone AI voice announced. I took a deep breath, but it suddenly felt like my lungs didn't know how to process air anymore. Four. I watched Judy Gagnon's delicate hand tremble. Three. Dr. Vega bit a nail, unable to hide his anticipation. Two. Mr. Francois finished his prayer and crossed himself. One. Dr. Vega absentmindedly stared at the fish tank that took up a whole wall. He had it installed on our main experimenting room because it calmed him down. Discharge activated. A blinding bolt of light filled the room. While the AI voice informed that the data download was now starting, I did my best to compose myself and regain my sight so I could search for signs that the test worked, or that it didn't. Download completed, the digital assistant announced mere seconds later. And I saw Lilith's hand twitching. We collectively held our breath until the two of them opened their eyes. All their organs came from sapiens donors, except for the brain that was completely reconstructed, as well as their outside limbs and skin. Ignis Dominum. Eve muttered, full of fury, like an anathema. Her eyes were transfixed on Dr. Vega. We had no time to be amazed. She clasped her fists, and Dr. Vega was sent flying in her direction. All the while, his trachea was being crushed. His dead body then fell like a stringless blue marionette. Oh, what the fuck? Judy screamed, running towards his corpse. Mr. Bissett let out a high-pitched shriek and hit under his assigned machinery. Eve started rising Judy in the air. But Lilith simply said, in a warning tone, Woman. I couldn't help but be stunned that it all worked. They came to life. And they knew English. Technically, their thoughts translated to English, and even to Latin, probably when they thought in a different language. But maybe Mr. Bissett was right, and they didn't have a soul. That's why they reacted so violently. Eve then let go of Judy Gagnon, carefully putting her up on her feet. Weird woman. Eve called out Judy. Why? We're not the same species as you. Judy replied nervously. As a computer programmer, she wasn't exactly a social butterfly. Seeing her hesitation, I decided to take the lead. We wanted to ask you, I said loud enough to make both the Neanderthals turn their gaze to me. What happened to your people? Even though Dr. Vega was killed, and things were bad, this was still only one casualty. My logical brain could only think that, after all this time, I was the chosen one to ask the question that every historian ever wanted to ask. The moment felt grandiose, sacred even. Eve looked calmer, but bitter. Your men afraid our powers, Lilith replied. Killed all those women using no. Eve screamed, interrupting her. We not kill women, but their women still enemy. After we die, men perish. Our kind end this generation. 
I'm really sorry, I said, not being able to think of anything else. I was indeed sorry for the violence they went through. Why are we here? Lilith asked, looking into my eyes. Despite her slightly beastly features, she was beautiful. The eyes and hair we gave her really matched her nicely. They had no idea that they were miracles of science. They barely knew what science was, other than vaguely knowing the word from Judy's vocabulary. Because we wanted to understand how your people disappeared. Mr. Bissett replied, coming out of the shadows. Our people no exist more. Lilith asked. I braced myself for tragedy as I saw Eve's furious reaction. Her eyes gleamed in rage as she roared, clenching her fists really tight. With a loud thump, Mr. Bissett's body and head fell, separately. Eve had squeezed him to the point of making his body fall apart, and she didn't even need to be freed from the shackles. Somehow, she was able to damage other people's bodies without even touching them, just manipulating it from a distance somehow. You horse people destroy all. Even finally yelled after a heavy moment of silence. Horse people. Did the sapiens went to war with them? And won because they were faster? Of course, animals had been tamed during the short time span of our coexistence. But maybe it was an exception? Maybe a few sapiens were able to incite wild horses against the Neanderthals. While my anthropology oriented brain conjectured, Judy was quick to act. Assistant, terminate subjects, she commanded. Checking all terminals. All terminals are functional. Preparing destructive discharge. The monotone computer voice replied. The eyes of the two Neanderthals gleamed with awareness. They knew what we were trying to do. No tricking. Eve screamed as she launched the whole wall-sized fish tank towards the machines, short-circuiting them. The fish tank was built in on the wall, so it would be more accurate to say that she broke the whole thing, sending shards, water, and fishes flying across the room. How did you know how to damage them, you prehistorical bitch? Terminals 1, 3, 4, 6, and 7 malfunctioning. Activating emergency mode. All entrances and exits locked. Luckily, both Judy and I were wearing lab coats and protective glasses. We shielded our face with our arms, and none of us got seriously injured. As the two of us recovered from the unexpected bath of fish scented water and glass, there was a loud, desperate knock on the door. Anne? It's me, Kathy. All the men in the conference room suddenly died. I rushed out of the room with Kathy. She was hysterical after watching over half of the co-workers die. I wanted Judy to leave with me. But I knew that this would upset Eve even more. You go and calm people down. I'll try to get our answers. My colleague whispered in Spanish. She hadn't programmed the Neanderthals to understand it. I was welcomed in the conference room. By the most heart-wrenching and gruesome scene I have ever seen. All around the mills I saw every day, worked with, choked with, were just corpses. Their faces, still and forever contorting in pain. Women were crying, cradling the lifeless heads of her peers and friends on their laps. No one was watching the TV that showed the main experimenting room. So I was the only one who paid attention as Julie tried to reason with Eve, and the Neanderthal demanded to be freed. You help revenge. Lilith ordered, moving her hands and throwing Judy against one of the damaged computers. Or you suffer. And I'll buy his time. Destroy this room somehow. Judy backed in Spanish. Dr. Vega installed a system that lets out sulfur mustard in that room. An older lady from the science department informed me. Still teary. It was to kill them in case they went berserk. Okay, this helps. But look at their power. I'm afraid it won't be fast enough. And we only have one chance to surprise them. How did the sapiens kill them? Even though the women were so powerful. I know Lilith said something helpful. Think. Think. Killed all of us women using. Ignisa Dominum. 
the way Eve threw the fish tank like it was nothing. How do they control people's bodies? What? What in people's body make them exert control over it? Water. The Neanderthal women can freely control water. So the sapiens killed them with the thing that made us a superior species. The way we instinctively killed witches across the millennia. With fire. Is sulfur mustard flammable? I asked aloud. One of the ladies from the biochemistry division replied that it isn't. Can any of you replace the sulfur mustard with something flammable and throw the fucking flames of hell on those Neanderthal bitches? Absolutely, a sturdy girl replied. Someone just needs to show me where. This gave our surviving team a sense of hope. I coordinated some girls and together they headed to the reservoir. I then sent all the remaining programmers to the control room. Maybe they could fix the system. Or at least part of it. Enough to deactivate the lockdown. It's been an hour since I started writing this. Judy bravely endured the injuries, refusing to release Ethan Lilith. I don't know if Judy realized that their power is to control water. But I know that she knows that freeing them from that room means that they'll make it outside and kill thousands, probably millions of people. Our facility is on an isolated location, surrounded by a body of water from all sides except for one. It's a matter of looking through the window to see it. And they would use all this water to destroy the building. Maybe we won't die. Maybe, for a miracle, the tech people will restore the system. But we all have accepted our deaths as punishment for playing God. The fire just started. I'm not sure if Judy is still alive. She wasn't moving lately. And I don't know what's worse, being beaten or burning to death. It seems to be working, as both Eve and Lilith let out guttural screams and cursed at me. The room I'm in is very close to there. It's quickly getting hot and steamy in here. None of the terminals are fixed yet. The men's corpses are starting to smell. The Neanderthals were so scary. At first, I felt bad for Lilith and Eve. But now, I'm glad we exterminated them. My only wish is that this time, we got rid of every last one of them. For good. <laughs>